for the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase. It's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Hi, welcome to Heard Tell. We got one of our favorites back. You may have noticed there's a little bit of UK news in the news. Anytime we do that, we bring in our friend. She's a historian. She's a writer. She's one of Heard Tell's favorite guests. Sarah Stook, ladies and gentlemen. How are you, ma'am? I'm good. Thank you for having me on again. It's always very fun to do. Uh, glad to have you. Uh, yeah, slow news days in the UK. Nothing major going on. Uh, just, you know, a new PM, a new king, you know, just minor technicalities of life. Um, let, let's start right there, though. We're making a little bit of fun of it, is, but we, we've seen the London version of it. We've seen the media version of it. We've seen the American media version of it, which has been really interesting to watch. Take me to Grimsby. What's just the normal UK working class town folk? What are they doing the last couple of days? How's this been hitting them? Because we get the men on the street uh, kind of stuff, which is really funny because the first time Charles went by, they managed to get the one American in the crowd on the camera shot. What is it just around you, around Grimsby, around the Midlands, the rest of the country? How's a lot of this landing right now? People are very, you know, upset. I mean, floral tributes everywhere, people signing memorial books. I mean, because you knew it was going to happen one day, you know, she's, it's not like she's young, she's 90, she was 96. So when like the news came, because I, me and my parents were out, we were in Sheffield, which is just a little out of Grimsby, and, um, we were shopping, so I didn't have like wasn't looking at my phone. Then late about like two o'clock, it had news that the Queen was been taken ill, and they're all gone to Balmoral. So I was thinking that isn't very good. So when we got home around like half three, four, we had like the news on for like the rest of the evening. And then at about quarter past half past six, um, the BBC news reader said, "Oh, announced that the Queen has died." And we're like, "Oh, this is very very weird." Yeah, we were we were talking to our friend Ben up there. He's like. When you heard Liz Truss come out, basically her first address to the country, how's that for a hard gig? And the end of her speech, she goes, God save the king. It was just like, wow, that sounds weird. And then you it remember, does. like, there's there's very few people in living memory that have ever said that, you know, other than it's in film or joking weird. or something. And he and I asked him on the show and like he flubbed it. He couldn't even get it out of his mouth because it was just so bizarre to try to say. Exactly. I mean, my late grandfather, he served in um, during the funeral. It, when he was in the RAF, he was part of the funeral procession in London for her father. So, you know, you mentioned something to me, too. And I wanted to ask you about it. The military, we've seen all the tributes, of course. And, of course, Charles gets his Regency stuff, so he's been getting it as well. I don't know. Folks in America and the worldwide audience may not realize, you know, we take our oaths to the Constitution. They take their oaths to the Queen or the King. Now it'll be. Um, and that's a very real thing, even though it's still, you know, mostly a ceremonial position. That's a very real thing for the British military. And they feel these sorts of things very deeply, don't they? Yeah, well, my dad's ex-military, when he served, he swore allegiance to the Queen. And it's taken very seriously to the point where if there was like the the monarch, uh, the prime ministers tried to do a coup, the army's loyal to the monarch so they could sort of counter coup it and i mean it sounds like something you'd have in like an african despot nation with lots of coups but that's what would happen i you're the historian that we always bring on for historical context you did a wonderful thread that is very long of all this stuff how do you quantify something that started her reign we're talking about here queen elizabeth pre-space age through the internet age, through the social media age, to whatever we're calling our current age in the year of our Lord, 2022. That's just a tremendous, the 70 years is one thing. 
the technology and time shift and the amount of history that's been condensed in that 70 years, you're a historian. You give us that perspective on this show. Usually it's mind boggling the amount of stuff that's happened in the last 70 years, isn't it? I mean, she was born in 1926. So to put it into context, Calvin Coolidge was president and now it's Joe Biden. I mean, she's seen, you know, from Coolidge to Biden, that's, you know, a lot of president, 30% of America has been, you know, through her reign. She's, you know, done it for that long. I think probably the best equivalent I can think of for Americans is when FDR died after 12 years in office. I mean, 12 years, 70 years is not comparable, but if you were young and you'd never known anyone but FDR, it's kind of a shock. Yeah. We, um, we were talking about it too. Is there a comp to her? You know, obviously time-wise, that sort of thing, it's going to be Victoria. But I've asked other people this, what's your, is she above that now? Is she still going to be compared to Victoria? Is she paramount above everybody else? Where do you think this fall? I know there's going to be recency bias because she just died, but just the numbers and all of it and everything together, is, is that the comp or is she number one on the list now, do you think? Well, she's been, you know, longest serving for a couple of years. And if she'd lasted a couple more years, she would have beaten Louis, the son king of France. That's pretty impressive. Both she and Queen Victoria. I mean, George III is another very long-lived one, have lived through incredible... I mean, when the Queen was, you know, crowned, women couldn't get bank accounts without their husband's permission. Marital rape wasn't a crime in England until 1991. It's amazing things like that. The idea of a woman prime minister in 1953 would have been completely alien, and now we're on three. Yeah, and Theresa May talked about this when she gave her, her remarks in the Commons. Um, and she was talking about Thatcher, but she was talking about herself as extension. And of course, Liz Truss is now the prime minister, also a woman. She, she just said, she's like, it wasn't that hard of a thing because we had a female queen. So of course we can have a female prime minister. And of course we can have, and people can, you know, kind of say, well, it's sophistry, but she means that in the parliament, even though it's a ceremonial role, and we talked to our friends in parliament about it, they said the same thing. It's a very real thing. Her constant presence, the fact that she was there, the consistency of it. Even though it's a ceremonial role, it was an important role, and it was a very real thing for the British government, wasn't it? I mean, she is head of state. I remember when I went to Boston a few years ago, we looked around the um, like the state capital, the state building, and our tour guide said there was a certain place where you could only open the doors for the head of state, and David Cameron was really peeved they couldn't do it for him because he was head of government, not head of state. And that's the important you know, difference. I mean, yeah, we, we've had quite a lot of, you know, female leaders in countries that aren't monarchies, you know, India, Pakistan, Australia. They are Commonwealth, though, if you notice, and lots of sort of Nordic countries. So I think that's a very good point. It makes it a bit more palatable that a woman could be in charge. To put it in perspective, talking to our friend Sarah Stuck. Uh, you talked about her, her being born when Calvin Coolidge was president. Her first uh, official presidential audience was Harry Truman. And Joe Biden, our current president, was nine years old at the time. And of course, he's now 79. That's just mind boggling. Truman through, you said it already, the stat, 30% of all American history she reigned over. There's been so much change. All the presidents she saw through. There's one or two because you've always you've been on here doing your presidential list with us before. You know, we saw the picture like Reagan and Thatcher had a close relationship. Is there a certain U.S. presidential visit with the queen that kind of sticks out in your mind? Well, she's met all of them, but um, Lyndon Johnson, but she actually did meet Lady Bird Johnson quite a few years later. That was later. probably a good thing considering how LBJ <laughs> conducted himself. Yeah, I think she probably, Princess Margaret, it was good to send Princess Margaret. I think she was more his wavelength. Uh, the ones I usually think of, um, well, there's the famous one where John and Jackie Kennedy came and it's rumoured that she and Jackie kind of clashed a little bit. Um, I think she seemed to get on quite well with Reagan. The, uh, there's the uh, pictures of them ho right, uh, horses together and everyone who knew the Queen knows she loved horses. Um, I think she into quite on quite well with Michelle Obama, and um, for all his sort of buff talk, she seemed to like Trump, and he was very respectful of her.
Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Talking to our friend Sarah Stuck over in the UK. Some big doings over there you may have heard. Uh, talking about the historical parts of this. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where to really start with this, but for those that don't know, we've had three King Charleses now. I think the bar's pretty low to say that he he's already probably, since he didn't die young and he's not going to be beheaded, he's probably beat out his predecessors. But you want to touch on that just real quick. What are the what are kind of the the expectations of Charles? Are folks just kind of hoping he holds the line? I don't think there's high expectations of him because he's following the legend, but what do people do expect from him, do you think? Well, I think something I've noticed is that, um, you know, the Queen hasn't travelled abroad for years because, you know, she's been old and frail. But, you know, Charles is younger. He can probably do trips abroad, so there'll be state visits and the White House might open its doors to him. So, of course, obviously you have the younger royals going sort of in its place, but we'll have the actual monarch be able to go out and go to. And I think it's handy for him to go to like Australia and New Zealand to like sort of stop any rumblings of um, sort of republicanism. (laughs) (laughs) Shudder. Good monarchist that you are, Shudder. That's a real thing, though. And there's already talk of him doing a Commonwealth tour. There was a lot of talk that when the Queen died that the Commonwealth would be an issue in a lot of places. Um, a lot of people think that might have been tapped down a little bit now. Charles, as long as he doesn't drop the ball, they think it may maintain. But they're obviously cognizant of it because they're already openly talking about him doing a full-blown Commonwealth tour, which, of course, hasn't happened in many, many years. She, the Queen went to parts of it, but she didn't do the full thing that she did when she was younger, for example. Is the Commonwealth secure? Is there a feeling that it's going to be okay, at least for the near-term future, as long as Charles doesn't make a total shambles of it? I think some of the Caribbean islands are a bit of a a stretch, but I think Australia and New Zealand, you know, I spoke to my aunt who lives in Australia, and she said there's not a huge appetite, apart from their current Prime Minister being a Republican. And it's actually uh, younger people in Australia who are really big fans. It's not just the older people, young people are as well which I think is quite handy for them. Um, I can't really speak on New Zealand, but you know, if you look at the outpouring of grief and then the support for the new king, I'm pretty hopeful. Is the comment in, in England where you live, is the Commonwealth still a big deal? Is it, it you know, under, obviously the, the allyship of that and the economics and all that, but is it is it a thing that people are cognizant of, of like, oh, we want this to remain? Is it something that's talked about? I don't think it's necessarily talked about a lot, only really if you're very political or interested in the monarchy. I suppose most people probably support it, but there's not really like a, a huge discussion of it as there probably should be. But maybe often that conversations come about because of Charles and they always say, you know, everyone thought when the Queen died, everything would go a bit rubbish. Talking about things that go uh, rubbish, I I don't think Charles will make a terrible showing of it. I don't know that he'll be spectacular, but I think he'll do the job because it's just that's who that guy is. Talk about the rest of the royal family though that's now on deck. William and Kate is on deck. Law, you know, they're respected by the public. They're loved by the public. A lot of the public would prefer him probably to be king right now than Charles. Let's just be honest about it. But they'll they're probably content to wait ten or fifteen, twenty years, whatever it's going to be. How is this, does this change William and Kate's place, uh, other than obviously they get the titles Prince and Princess of Wales? What's their viewpoint now? Because they're, you know, here you are, he's a heartbeat away now. Well, if you think about it, they probably don't want to be king and queen yet because their kids are still quite young. When the kids are growing up, it's a lot of an easier transition. And if something, you know, God forbid, happened to Charles or he abdicated, that is going to make their life a lot harder because if you think about you know Charles and Anne were very young when the Queen came to the throne Andrew and Edward know nothing but their mother being Queen so I think it'd be nice for their children to like just be children even though you know um, George is now second in line to the throne yeah and the other thing we were talking about somebody on Twitter gamed it out of course you're just guessing but you know Charles is in his mid-70s William's in his early 40s and George is very young excuse me, and George is very young, we may not see another reigning queen in our lifetime the way the secession line is stacking up. Of course, you know, when Elizabeth came to the throne, there was probably very few of anybody that had living memory of Victoria. But 
it, and even if George has a girl first, you're probably looking at 80, 90, 100 years before you get a reigning queen again. Does that make the Elizabethan reign, Elizabeth the Great, um, Boris Johnson called her, and I think that's fair. Do you think her legend and her legacy just grows over time since this is probably going to be a rare event in living memory for quite a while? Well, we only, uh, there's only one uh, queen regnant in the world, and it's the uh, queen of is that, or is it Netherlands or Denmark? It's one of those two, and I can't remember right now which one it is, but it's one of them. Um, so every, every other rainy monarch is a dude. So, yeah, it kind of takes the magic away a bit. But I think when you think of, if I asked an American, what royals do you think of, like monarchs? They'd probably say Henry VIII, George III, Victoria, and our current, well, Queen Elizabeth II. You know, you think of the women, and, you, and all of them, because there are fewer women regnants than there are men. We've only had, you know, Matilda is and Lady Joan Grey are disputed, but there's um, Mary I, Mary II, Elizabeth I, Elizabeth II, Anne and Victoria. So it's not too many, but they're all, you know, very well remembered. And, you know, Elizabeth I, for example, and Victoria and Elizabeth II live, had fairly long reigns. Yeah, uh, Sarah Stook joining us. Okay, you are a historian, so we're going to have some historic stuff here. Obviously, the funeral. We're going to have the coronation of Charles III. Boy, that sounds weird to say, but there it is. What's a couple of things you're watching for? Obviously, the world leaders are going to gather for both of those events. At least the funeral will probably have everybody. I know President Biden's already announced he's going to attend. As a historian, you know, weddings and funerals for the royal family, those are the big events coronations which are even more rare what's a couple of the things historically you're watching for here coming up i think it'll be interesting to see um which countries come to the funeral because obviously they've said there's limited space it's only the um head of state and the spouse or somebody representing them so it won't be like biden mrs biden and and all like kamala harris and the obamas and that will go it'll just be um Joe and Jill Biden go in, but we'll be interesting to see what countries send um, representatives. Also, you've got the major religions, so the Pope, or well, he, I don't know if he will go, but at least the representatives of the Holy See will go. There'll be, you know, rabbis and imams and, you know, sheikhs and all of all religions. Obviously, Putin isn't going to come because, you know, yeah, for obvious reasons, but I'm sure Russia will probably just have their ambassador go. I mean, pretty much every country, apart from maybe like North Korea and a few others, will send somebody, which is pretty remarkable. John Paul II's funeral is the biggest in history, but this is going to, you know, blow out of the water. Yeah, I wonder if Larnoff's going to come because his side family lives in London anyway, so he might try to sneak over for it. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, uh, I wonder, though, the funeral is going to be a big deal. Nobody over under the age of 80 has a living memory of a coronation. I know they're going to kind of be back to back. They'll space them out for the morning period. How big a deal is that? Because that doesn't happen that often. You may have, you may, folks may get to see two or three in their lifetime now after this, but they haven't seen one of these. How big a deal is that going to be? Well, I think because obviously I've, I'm one of, we're both one of those people who've never seen it. So it's going to be quite, you know, it's going to blow any presidential inauguration out of the water because love us or hate us, the Brits do pomp and ceremony like absolutely no one does. So it's going to be very grand and very lavish, full of colour and jewels. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of. I'm kind of questioning your bona fides here, though. Did you suggest that the Pope should come to the English monarchs? Look, Henry VIII did not behead wives just to have a papist show up at official ceremony. What are you doing? He will go. I don't think he will go. He's, you know, he has a lot of mobility, but they'll send a representative. But, well, the last time a monarch died was in 1952. So, you know, it's been a while, so you can't really compare what it would be like now. But I think we've sort of toned away from the whole breaking from Rome thing, because that did happen quite a long time ago. 
I don't know. Grudges run deep over yonder. Sarah Stuck joining us. We're having a little bit of fun with this because it, it has been a heavy thing and a busy day. Let, let's turn to the future, though. Um, Liz Trust is now the prime minister. Talk about your tough road to hoe. Your second day office, the queen dies. Second full day in office, the queen dies. Uh, Parliament's doing their their remembrances and then they're going to dissolve. I forget the big fancy word y'all use for that. It starts with a P. Um, so you'll you're going to have a new government all the way down. You have Charles as the, you know, ceremonial head of state. You're going to have a, a, the same parliament, but it's Liz Truss with a whole lot going on. The cost of living crisis is going on. Of course, foreign affairs are going on. This is really kind of a critical time in the UK right now. Northern Ireland's a bit of a mess at the moment. You've got migrant crises. There's a lot of stuff on the UK's plate this fall once they go through all this pomp and circumstance you're talking about. It's going to be a very bleak reality check kind of political fall, isn't it? I think in some ways it was kind of handy for Liz Truss. Well, I don't want to say handy, but the Queen's Eye sort of gave her a bit of a reprieve. I agree. But we've got the energy crisis, which is going to see bills go ridiculously expensive and you know that's going to be what people are focusing on and if you can't produce cheaper energy bills then you know that's hand-wrapped gift for labor yeah for folks that um in the u.s because we've been dealing with it a little bit but it's not been per- percentage-wise as bad here are folks noticing it when they go to the market when they're buying goods when they're trying to get around of course you're having uh, transportation strikes on top of everything else right now which that isn't helping either how noticeable is it? I know it's the number one issue when they poll it, but day to day, how how much is it really affecting folks? Because it seems to be like it's it, there's no real going to be reprieve in sight here. You you know, so everything has gone up from you know going to the chip shop, uh, general groceries. Everything has uh, gone up. You guys would have an absolute fit if you saw our petrol prices. Like you guys really don't like expensive petrol. Ours is way much more than yours is. I know you guys you know don't have a public transportation system, yada, yada, yada. But you guys would like, if you get upset at your fuel prices, you would just faint at ours. Oh, yeah. I remember first time I went to Germany, I'm like, you pay how much for gas over here? Because, you know, of course, we have coupons and SO credits and things like that. But I was like, what do you mean you pay 5 $6 a gallon for gas? This is outrageous. This is back when gas was like $1.50 in the States. So, yeah, it's a different world over there, definitely. Sarah Stuck joining us. Okay, I know it's your belly wake, so I'm going to throw it to you. The queen, of course, was always very proper, very, you know, she became, I don't think style icon is the right term, but the hats and the, and the you know, the way she dressed, it was definitely her style. I don't know that Camilla is going to exactly like the style world on fire, but I did notice you're somewhat chomping at the bit to get Kate in there because you, you can feel the fashion going up a couple clicks, can't you? Oh, she always looks so elegant so proper for every occasion and you know she mixes it up a bit like she wears trousers which you know the queen and camilla probably would very rarely if ever do and she also looked like she was you know if you look at her wedding dress it's very sort of grace kelly bringing lace back yeah she'll be so stylish she already is i think she's just so elegant you know, what you imagine a duchess and a future queen to wear she's totally got the style bit down pat yeah, we're going to have to get that girl a pair of jeans or something, work it out. Uh, Sarah Stuck, okay, friends hold friends accountable. I got to point your attention to one of your tweets here, though. Uh, I actually agree with this one, but some folks may not. You said, and I quote, there needs to be a mini series about Warren G. Harding administration. Uh, would that be a PG, a PG-13, or a good hard R on some prestige network, your your idealization of the Warren G. Hardy ministry? Well, I've um, just been reading a book called Accidental Presidents, which is about you know the eight presidents who came to office after their predecessor either died or was assassinated. So I've just read the Warren G. Harding chapter. And I was reading, and like, I'm already aware of how bad it was, but when you like sort of read the nitty gritty into it, just how corrupt, like the first cabinet officer ever to get prison time, it needs to be a, you know, a hard out. It needs to show the parties and the illegal prohibition drinking, the, you know, the sex and the scandal and the poker parties. I mean, a girl died at one of the parties. She was dancing by a table, somebody threw a bottle at her, hit her on the head, and she died. Lord, is America ready to see a president? Uh doing the nasty in the cloakroom though do you think if you like you said 
he, Warren G. Harding and LBJ would make Trump look like an altar boy. So, yes, yeah. you guys need it. And we, we've we had, you know, everyone knows of Henry VIII's exploits, but some of your presidents, I mean, look at Kennedy. That man was a machine. In all the wrong ways, which for a disabled guy was pretty impressive, actually, if you kind yeah, of. Yeah, him and FDR. FDR was in a wheelchair having affairs. You know, you've got to respect the hustle. We, we, not our finest hours when it comes to presidents sometimes, but what do you do? But we could go down the rural line and y'all got a couple of your, yourselves. Sarah Stook, we always love having you. Appreciate your time today. Uh, let folks know what you've got going on, what you're working on when, you know, we don't have monarchs changing hands and where they can follow you until we get you back on because you are a frequent guest and we appreciate you greatly. Well, the Mallard is um, not publishing anything until after the funeral because it's the morning period. Um, but I'm continuing my elections daily pieces on presidential runners up. I'm on stop. I'm rising part two. Um, for the uh, Mallard, I'm going to be writing next about um medieval marriages, the Regency marriage market, and uh, literal wit witch hunts in the 21st century, like in India and Nepal. Yeah. I that I will be all over. Yeah, the Mallard uh having a little fun with it. They they call it the regime change issue, uh, which was kind of cute. So be on the lookout for that. We'll link to all that. Sarah Stook, our friend in Grimsby. Always appreciate your time, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. <laughs>Uh, welcome back to Hertel. Okay, here's a fun one. Uh, Twitter buddy for a long time. They put out some polling. I had a question about it. He said, hey, you got a question about it? Let's talk about it. I said, do you want better? Come on the show. We'll talk about it. Uh, Jacob Perry, if you don't know him, he's been in politics for 20 years, inside him, outside him, analyzing them. He's now with Center Street Pack. How are you, buddy? Good to see you. I'm good, brother. Thanks for having me on. All right. The one that got everybody's attention, and we'll go through the rest of the polling data because you, you've been a political guy for a long time, especially Florida, because you know that race inside and out. We'll talk about that in a minute. The one that got my attention was the Arizona Senate polling race. Now, obviously, sure. this is a big ticket race. A lot of people paying attention to it. Um, the Polling USA poll that y'all did with in conjunction with Center Street. Kelly, 55, Masters, 35. Governor race, Hobbs 53, Carrie Lake 39. And all I said, I wasn't even being critical. I just said that doesn't feel right. And I use feel sure. for, that doesn't feel right. Now to my, you've done politics for a long way. You know my way of thinking. That's a 49-49 state last election. Those are both Trump adjacent candidates. Both are endorsed by Trump. So to think that they're going to be 14 and nine points off what Trump did, that just doesn't feel right. Tell me what we're missing here that your number's a little different. So I'm going to I'm going to issue a caveat and I'm going to start off by saying um, we do all of our own polling. So we don't we don't outsource it to a polling firm. This is all literally internal. Um, our data guy is Dr. Kurt Jetta, who has. Basically, is the guy who invented uh, consumer data aggregation. I actually explained to people that, you know, if you go to your local supermarket and you see the stuff that's a, that's a BOGO item. Um, Kurt's firm is actually the one that tells people what to do. So we, because we're not a polling firm, we don't do horse race polls. And this is what I always have to try to explain to people. We, the data that we gather and that we analyze is for our internal use as far as targeting and which races we're going to use to pursue and how we're going to, um, you know, write the advertising, the messaging we're going to use, the mediums we're going to, you know, put the advertising on. Um, I mean, for example, I don't know, a few weeks ago, we did a, a pretty significant six-figure buy in Ohio. 
And that advertising was intended to target um, females between 40 and 55, I believe, right? Kind of unaffiliated or kind of unsure or whatever. Um, that was a pretty significant six-figure buy, but it was based on the data that we have that that is the most movable segment in that race, right? So long caveat aside, what I'm going to tell you is our polling has been very consistent in terms of and they brand themselves as ultra MAGA, right? So the ultra MAGA versus a traditional Republican candidate are two very different things. And what we have seen in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Arizona, to some extent, uh, Georgia, which is another one that we just released. Um, those are candidates that are pretty extreme. Those are candidates who, you know, are, you know, anti-immigrant. They're anti, you know, they all believe that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, they all sort of poo-poo the January 6th insurrection. And I would contrast that with a Marco Rubio, who is a more traditional Republican and who is actually um, has a pretty solid lead on Val Demings. So in Arizona, you have Blake Masters, who is maybe the most extreme candidate of all of them, um, the most extreme views, the most ultra MAGA of all of them, who was running against a legit American hero, by the way, you know, an actual, you know, you and I are old enough to remember like astronauts are pretty cool dudes. Um, and they're the kind of guys that are walking down the street that you look up and go, holy crap, that's an astronaut. So I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a masters is I'm going to respectfully say a borderline white nationalist. Um, and maybe not borderline, but based on his statements and things that he's on record, um, he's pretty extreme. But then you've got Mark Kelly, who is um, has an extremely, frankly, remarkably high favorability rating in Arizona. So it's kind of a combination of the two things. What I always say to everybody is, in 30 years or so of working in politics, every election takes place in a vacuum. So what happened two years ago, four years ago, you have to take that in context of what was going on two years ago and four years ago. And what you're seeing now in this particular context of this cycle is a lot of extremist candidates who have very high unfavorability ratings. Yeah. And to be clear, I think both of those people are unfit for office, just to be frank about it. The other part of the Kelly thing that people don't talk about, but I hear it every time I bring it up, talking to people behind the scenes is he's been just an absolute money machine. He's one of the biggest fundraisings in the entire Democratic Party, not just in the yeah. Senate. Yeah. Um, he's printing money. So yes. when you have the can, and I'm going to lump Masters and Lake here big together because they basically are a ticket for all practical purposes out there. They're running yep. together, campaigning together. I think they're both unfit for office, but it is what it is. Is the story here from what you're seeing? Because again, you admit you're looking at the data differently than what a pollster is in the horse race, and that, and that has its pros and cons. Is yep. what we're Great. seeing here, big picture wise, just for the average person without getting into the weeds of the data. That when you try to out Trump Trump himself and you're not named Trump, that ceiling, that shoot people on Fifth Avenue number, whatever you want to call it, that number starts going down the more you go into that territory. And that's what you're starting to see in some of these Senate races that, frankly, shouldn't be close. Looking at you, J.D. Vance in Ohio. Right. And the Republicans are struggling. Is that the lesson here that you're taking away from it? Because that kind of seems how it feels. Yeah. And I think, again, the, the fact that and we're not involved, at least at the moment, in the Florida Senate race, but we're tracking it as a way to sort of buttress our results. Right. So we can compare and contrast this theory of the ultra MAGA versus the more mainstream Republican. Um, and again, it's Florida. I get it. But you're right. I mean, in, in an ordinary year, and I think this is where some of the controversy came from in an ordinary year, J.D., you know, the Republican candidate in Ohio should be up eight or nine points, right? Like, we're, we're not pretending otherwise. Um, but in our data, and I don't know if we've reported this in any of our stuff, and I'm just going to tell you, and maybe this isn't exclusive for your audience, the one negative response that comes back from our surveys regarding J.D. Vance is phony. And you're almost a Midwesterner. I mean, you're kind of border Midwesterner. I grew up in Indiana. Um 
you know, in in the Midwest, we tend to prefer, you know, genuine people. We tend to prefer, you know, this is why the Midwest is a very different place than anywhere else in the country. It's a very down to earth. People are pretty normal. People are friendly. They know their neighbors. And the the constant response that keeps coming back on JD Vance is phony. And when you compare that to a Tim Ryan, who isn't a extreme left wing, you know, he's not Elizabeth Warren. He's much of a he's much more of a blue dog, kind of an old school Joe Biden type, right? So the combination of two things is what's giving you a fairly surprising result. Jacob Perry joining us real quick. Two other races. I want to ask you about why I got you on the line. Uh, you just mentioned it. So let's talk about Rubio. You got him up about five points. Again, just somebody that watches this and somewhat reads on, tries to keep up with it and talks to people that felt right. When I saw it, um, DeSantis is probably going to win his race. So there's going to be some flow over there. Rubio's (laughs) his national brand has been damaged, but he's pretty still in the main line for a Florida Senator with all things considered. Charlie Chris is going to be the first person in recorded human history to lose a race as a Republican Democrat and an independent. That's pretty amazing. (laughs) But that feels right. You know Florida inside and out. You live there. Does does that one feel like that's probably going to be about what it is? Maybe Demings might get a little surge depending, or she might fall off depending on how the economy and Biden and all that goes. But this kind of feels like what it's been all along and where it's going to end up. The problem that, that Val is running into, Congresswoman Demings is running into, um, and I apologize. Sometimes, it's, you know, we're, we're doing the constant conversations all day. They're shorthand that we use. Um, Congresswoman Demings just doesn't have a very high name ID. And obviously, Senator Rubio does. And so that's actually been the biggest. And, and our model is weighted towards favorability and name ID, right? Which is why sometimes we're a couple points ahead of everybody else. And what we've seen is consistently Congresswoman Deming's name ID and favorabilities have been relatively flat. There's been a couple of waves, if you will. But it's been relatively flat and she was making some good, some decent gains. And then quite honestly, instead of telling her story, um, she started going negative and voters have kind of mixed feelings about that stuff. And so instead of using that opportunity to tell her story, she's got a remarkable story, went to a segregated elementary school, you know, started out as a beat cop in Orlando, became police chief. Like she has an incredible story and she's not telling her story. And so. Because of that, that's allowed Senator Rubio, who has a, a pretty significant cash advantage, to define her instead of, you know, it's the age old thing. She's she's not defining herself. He's defining her. One more race I wanted to ask you about. Uh, down in Georgia, uh, Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock, Herschel Walker. Uh, you got Warnock up a little bit. I've been on the island since last January of 2020 being like, no, y'all, y'all need to understand Warnock's going to be a really hard out because that race got really ugly and personal and the national media didn't cover it because of all the Trump stuff. But that, that was an ugly, ugly race. The reason I wanted to ask about it is Herschel Walker though. His numbers have actually started improving. We mentioned JD Vance. This is not my opinion. This is source. I've talked to multiple people about this. You've heard the exact same stories. J.D. Vance has absolutely refused to take any help from any wing. I'm talking conservative, moderate. The libertarians reached out to him. He's refusing anybody helping him, and his campaign's been a mess. All of a sudden, about six weeks ago now, Herschel Walker took outside help, and Mm -hmm. it's showing, and his numbers are getting better. I bring that up because that's going to be an important contest as he tries to tighten this up and tries to knock off Senator Raphael Warnock and what's going to be a really close, really – Hopefully it's not as ugly as 2020. We'll see. But that's the difference in the numbers there is Herschel. Somebody got a hold of him and said, hey, you need some help. Let's get some folks in here. Yes. And, 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 and look, let's be honest. It's Georgia. Right. And, and and I'm sitting, you know, 45 minutes from the Georgia state line. So I'm not exactly unfamiliar with Georgia and Georgia politics. I mean, this is the, this is the state that elected Marjorie Taylor Greene. Right. So it is Georgia. 
Herschel Walker played for University of Georgia, um, was a you know an incredible hero back in the early 80s in Georgia, still has remarkable name ID. Senator Warnock, if I, I have to be really honest, is probably a little too far on the left. Um, or at least, you know, we talked about Arizona, right? Senator Kelly has done an excellent job of being, you know, let's call it left of center, right? Like relatively center, left of center, probably left on some things, but hasn't gone completely off the reservation. Senator Warnock has a much more liberal voting record. And again, it is Georgia and it's Georgia, <laughs> right? Like it's Georgia. I don't know. And, it, it's, and like, it's one of the reason you're saying it's Georgia is because you have Atlanta and you got everything else. Correct. Atlanta exactly is rapidly right. diversifying. It's rapidly going purple. It's one yep. of the most dynamic cities in a yep. lot of ways. And that's yep. showing politically. And then you got everything else, which is the rural part of Georgia, which is still deep red country. Yeah. And then you so got this outlier of Herschel Walker, who's a, let's just call it what it is. He's a celebrity candidate with no background. Yep. And you have a, a very traditional progressive up through the ranks, you know, ministerial background, social justice background, progressive. Yep. He's being authentic about it, by the way, which is why he doesn't yep. get dinged on it, because that is who he is. Absolutely. I mean, this is almost like a political class theory on how to do a race on a celebrity candidate and a well-grained one in a very changing, rapidly changing state. And that's why I get exactly what you're saying. And the folks will too. And you're saying it's Georgia. Nobody's right. got a handle on what Georgia is right now. If they're just honest yeah. about it. No. And, and, and what is it? Is it Marietta County? That's the, the very, the next North of Georgia or of Atlanta, obviously Georgia. Um, yeah. The, the bucket. You know, where the Brave Stadium is. And, yeah. 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 It's a mess. Like that. That's becoming more purple. I mean, we we actually tracked uh, a couple of races in Georgia. We looked at playing in uh, the MTG district, for example. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Georgia over the past uh, almost a year now, I guess. Um, you're exactly right. Like, like Senator Warnock has to carry Fulton County, like, by a landslide. Has to carry, you know. Which he will, by the way. Yeah, yeah, he will. But, but the time that I spent in northwest Georgia, Rome, kind of that area, which is where uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene's district is, um, that is the lowest vaccination percentage, COVID vaccination percentage in the country, right? So, and that's 45 minutes north of Atlanta, northwest of Atlanta. So it is Georgia, and he is Herschel Walker. Like, if it was someone else, if it was Jeff Duncan, for example, the outgoing lieutenant governor, this would be a very different race. And, and I have a lot of respect for, for Lieutenant Governor Duncan. This would be a very different race. But it's kind of the same dynamic we have here locally in Tallahassee, where I'm at, where you have a candidate for state Senate who played football at Florida State. Well, you know, Bob unless they find right off the jump. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, unless they find the body of a four-year-old girl in the back of his car, like he's pretty much guaranteed election. And Georgia and Georgia football or whatever, you know, whatever Herschel Walker has said, whatever crazy statements he's made, whatever, the more he keeps his mouth shut and the more he does private events that are off the record, whatever, he's probably going to win this thing by four to six points. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch either which way. Uh, Jacob Perry, appreciate the quick time. Get you back on here again. Uh, let folks know what you've got going on here with Center Street Pack again. Again, y'all ain't biased. You're out here with doing what you're doing, but you do it well. Yeah. Uh, let folks know where they can find what you're doing and what you're doing. We're going to link to the polling, the actual polling, not just the tweets, because they do have their information at the bottom, which is always a sign of a good poll. Let folks know we where share. they can follow you until we talk again. No, I appreciate that. We share everything. We're very open about uh, the data that we that we analyze, that we gather. Um, it's at Center Street Pack uh, on Twitter, centerstreetpack.com on the web. Um, and then I am at Real Jacob Perry um, if you are predisposed to following somebody crazy on Twitter. We bump heads on some things, we agree on other, but it's always entertaining, buddy. Uh, especially Absolutely. during English English soccer season and football <laughs> over there, because it, it, that wall doesn't have it, but he does have some paraphernalia. We'll just leave it at that. Jacob, thanks for the time today, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having thanks, me on. Sir.
This is nothing new under the sun territory, although what, most of what we're going to be doing, we're going to be dealing off of Marx's remix of it. And we'll sure. get to that in a minute. But we had this all through ancient history. The Greeks debated a communal society. That's actually how we got democracy was they were debating com- communalism or not communism as we're using it, but communalism, rejecting it, said, well, that ain't going to work. We got to have some structure. That's kind of how they started getting into democracy. We see it in biblical text. We have it in Eastern Asian texts from way back before anything in the Western world, before most of those people were even writing properly. This is all throughout human history, this idea of communal living. Everybody's going to be equal. Everybody's going to share. That's all well and good. The reason it hasn't worked until now is because anybody that's been in a kindergarten room understands that sharing without some kind of external force usually doesn't turn out really well. I know that's a whole lot of human history to bridge before you get to Marx, but just kind of nutshell it. That's the thing is this is a very old idea in human behavior of well, let's just all be communal and people keep coming back to it over and over and over again. That's really the overarching theme here, isn't it? Um, brilliantly put. And yes, in fact, there is nothing new about Hegel. This is one of those things that really irks me is that Hegel's not doing anything different from Plato. Uh, when when you get Pl- Plato, I'm not going to say that Plato gives you uh Hegelianism, although I think for Hegel, he certainly does. Um, I, I Yes, it comes out in many, many cultures throughout history. You're also correct that the reason that you can socialize things and, and you can have different stratifications of, 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 you know, of collectivization is because you have brute force. But when you give people the opportunity to pursue their own lot and pursue their own meaning as it's become more and more possible to do through industrialization, uh, then what ends up happening is people say, no, I want to keep more for myself. And when that happens, then you get a tension. You get a, a huge tension between this ideal of what could be and and making everyone equal and keeping everyone safe through equality as it's defined by the superior, right? As it's defined by the most advantaged. And this tension of wanting to pursue your own ends, wanting to pursue your own ideal of meaning, really we're talking about existentialism, that's more revolutionary. Um, and it's it's funny how you'll get a lot of socialist existentialist which i i consider myself an existentialist and it, it is it is interesting to see that that tension even within existentialism um but yeah it's uh communism and that idea tries to keep everything stagnant to a point and is incredibly threatened by this idea that people can pursue their own meaning and pursue their own ends. And when you look at the history of communism and when you look at the history of attempts to socialize, what ends up happening is that the people for whom communism is putatively intended reject it. You know, the the the, the Paris Commune, the anarchists said, no, we kind of just want to live peacefully. Uh, when you had the, uh, the, 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 to the, uh, to the people movement uh, in Tsarist Russia, the people just kind of wanted more of their own land. When you tried to socialize the factory workers initially, the factory workers, were ca- well, they kind of wanted capitalism. They, they just, they wanted to, they wanted to keep more of their own money. So time and again, the people, the, the people, lowercase t, lowercase p, for whom communism is intended to help, reject it. And so communism has to fabricate this ideal of capital T, capital P, the people that don't exist. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.